I'm Richard Waller, Director of the University Museums here at the University of Richmond. We are delighted that you've joined us this evening to celebrate the opening of our exhibition, Aesthetic Ambitions, Edward Lysette and Brooklyn's Fayon's Manufacturing Company in our Laura Robbins Gallery of Design from Nature. Um, this is the first time that we've used this, this new venue of the National Center for an opening lecture, so I'm hoping that uh, in the future it will be a little easier to find, find the, the way between our two places. The exhibition was organized by the University of Richmond Museums and was curated by Barbara Byth. We are delighted the exhibition will travel to the Mint Museum in Charlotte following its venue here and then will continue to the Brooklyn Museum. Before introducing our speaker, I would like to acknowledge several important people who have been essential to this project. First and foremost, we sincerely thank Emma and Jay Lewis for their central role in the exhibition and the overall project. Um, also, we are delighted to have Barry Harwood, Curator of Decorative Arts at the Brooklyn Museum, uh, with us tonight. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce Barbara Bight, the guest curator of our exhibition. Barbara is an independent scholar of American ceramics and glass, and she has been absolutely wonderful to work with throughout the planning and organizing and planning and organizing <laughs> of this exhibition. Um, and I know you'll be thrilled when, when you um, view the exhibition later this evening. She received her BA from Mount Holyoke College in Art History and her Master's in the History of Decorative Arts and Design from the Master's Program of Parsons and Cooper Hewitt. Barbara was trained in the Department of American Decorative Arts at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where she was a research associate until very recently. Prior to that, she was at Christie's in New York for several years. Currently, she is teaching a course, American Ceramic History, 1760 to 1920, in the master's program at the uh, Parsons Cooper Hewitt program. Her research is focused extensively on Edward Lissette, which should come as no surprise to any of us. Uh, we have benefited greatly from her knowledge and expertise particularly when it comes to looking closely at Edward Lysette, at the art pottery of Brooklyn's Fayance Manufacturing Company, and at that whole period of American decorative arts. Um, come on in. Following her lecture, we will have time for a few questions, and then we will all need to walk um, a couple of blocks over to the museum for the reception and to view the exhibition. Please join me in welcoming part of the life. Good evening, and thank you, Richard, for your time and introduction. Edward Lysette and the Fans Manufacturing Company have been part of my life for more than 10 years now, and I'm delighted to have the opportunity to share my enthusiasm for this enterprising English immigrant and the art pottery that he directed with you this evening. But first, I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to Richard Waller and the staff of the University Museums for the many ways in which they helped in the realization of this exhibition. Um, my sincere thanks to Emma and Jay Lewis for their generosity and vital support and special thanks to Alice Puni, Freelingheisen, the Anthony W. and Lulu Wong, Lulu C. Wong, Curator of American Decorative Arts at the Metropolitan Museum of Art for her support in sparking the genesis of this exhibition, and to Dr. Perry R. Harwood, Curator of Decorative Arts at the Brooklyn Museum of Art for his um, insightful and um, astute um, assistance in the evolution of the exhibition. I'm grateful to the private and public lenders to the exhibition. Their participation has made possible this unprecedented opportunity to look at the work of the Fans Manufacturing Company. The 1880s in New York City were a time of tremendous technological progress and spectacular wealth. This was an era that was known as the Gilded Age. I just realized I better give you an object to look at. Um, prosperous post-Civil War Americans living in an increasingly industrial society. 
enjoyed unprecedented leisure time for artistic and cultural pursuits. Um, <clears throat> major exhibitions, such as the 1876 exhibition in Philadelphia, introduced Americans to the arts of the near and far east and to the uh, British design reform and aesthetic movements. The aesthetic movement advocated that art be infused in all aspects of life, and well-to-do Americans um, that filled their homes with artistic furniture, ceramics, glass, metalwork, textiles, and wallpaper. Many times, um, these objects uh, displayed a synthesis of near and far eastern designs in their form and decoration. This eclecticism reflected the owner's cultural savvy and good taste. And what you displayed in your home said an awful lot about what, you, what you'd seen of the world, what you knew of the world. This is not dissimilar from the way we view our homes today, our interiors today. This dynamic aesthetic, movements, aesthetic movement synthesis of Chinese, Islamic, and Japanese influences is characteristic of the fans manufacturing companies' artistic ceramic wares. In October 1888, three New York City newspapers excitedly described the completion of an immense Persian-style ceramic vase seen here in a rare period image. They said it was an astonishing work of art and a triumph in the line of fans' pottery. This monumental vase, probably the largest of its kind ever decorated, measured 42 inches high and 24 inches high, excuse me, wide. This is an immense object. The body featured poppies and clematis outlined with raised gold paste on a dark bronze ground and elaborate gilded handles flanked a partly pierced neck and domed cover. Priced between three and five hundred dollars, it was considered the most expensive piece of American pottery offered for sale and compared favorably with the finest productions of the European potteries. Edward Lysette, seen here, the English-born art director, beginning in 1884, of the Fanos Manufacturing Company, designed and produced this magnificent object. <coughs> the Fanos Manufacturing Company, and I will now switch to, or FMCO, that's much easier, was an important but short-lived New York City art pottery that manufactured ornamental ceramic wares in its Brooklyn pottery that it sold in showrooms in Lower Manhattan. The firm reached its creative, creative zenith under Lysette, who had immigrated to the United States in 1861. And within two years of his arrival at FMCO, he transformed the firm's artistic identity. He experimented with clay bodies and glazes and designed bold and eclectic wares in a style favored by the aesthetic movement. Between 1886 and 1889, FMCO's opulent wares earned critical acclaim in the press and were sold by elite retailers across the nation, a testament to the success of Edward Lysette's aesthetic ambitions. These fertile years in the firm's history are the focus of this exhibition. Under the direction of Bernard Veit, a partner in the prosperous millinery goods manufacturer and importer Veit and Nelson, FMCO was incorporated, or the Fans Manufacturing Company was incorporated in 1881. Veit was president, Joseph Offenbach, an exchange broker, was vice president, and Veit's son-in-law, Joseph Baruch, was the secretary and treasurer. FMCO produced ornamental white body earthenware that was sold in the showrooms at Veit and Nelson's fashionable French fans and Limoges wear served as models for the firm's early wares. The relief decorated pieces, of which we see an example on the left, were called barbatine wear, and they display these um, applied three-dimensional floral um, forms and branches. In contrast to the barbatine pieces, the firm's Limoges wear, seen on the right, was painted with flat underglaze colors, and um, in this case we see, well, we see a cabin on the opposite side, but a wooded landscape. A rare surviving trade catalog of about 1881 illustrates at least 140 forms, including vases, of which we see examples right here. And if you look carefully, you'll see something familiar on the <coughs> row um, in the right. They offered uh, baskets, lamps, and umbrella stands in decorated and biscuit versions for amateurs to decorate. The firm's first mark consisted of the initials FMCO impressed into the base and the impressed numbers indicated um, the shape of the piece and correspond to the numbers in the trade catalog. So here we have, for example, 
The base on the left is impressed 297 on the base, and then here we see the corresponding base 297 on the right. FM Co. flourished and between 1882 and 83 moved its showrooms from Vice and Nelson's to its own premises on Warren Street and then on Barclay Street, both in Lower Manhattan. And as indicated in their advertisement at the bottom, you see new styles added weekly. And here we see two examples of the firm's increasingly varied production. On the left, this is a red flambe glazed um, Chinese form vase that's also looking to Chelsea Ceramic Artworks production of this time. And on the right, we see a novel Myolica basket form with a speckled frog eyeing a little fly on a floral <laughs> blossom. It's good for a chuckle. <laughs> and then here we see vases with streaked or mottled glazes on the left, and see here on the right a very unusual uh, porcelain glaze with Vase with classicizing decoration um, that represents these represent other facets of the firm's increasingly diverse production. In the competitive art pottery industry, stylistic versatility was critical for longevity. And by 1883, consumer interest in these French inspired, not these, but the earlier French inspired wares waned in favor of near and far eastern style wares produced by the Worcester Royal Porcelain and Derby Crown Porcelain Companies of England and American potteries modified their output, output accordingly. So FM Co. focused on Royal Worcester ivory body wares decorated with Japanese birds, flowers, and fruit in rich, uh, rich gold relief as seen on this two-handled urn form vase. Jonathan Coxon, who descended from a prominent family of Trenton potters, created FM Co.'s new ivory body. It was known as porcelain or Parisian granite and was praised as the most ambitious thing the Fayence Manufacturing Company have yet achieved. And in December 1883, a critic in the Crockery and Glass Journal remarked that, and I quote, an exceedingly handsome vase and white ivory was on exhibition last Saturday at the sales rooms of the Fayence Manufacturing Company and may now be seen at Tiffany's. This is the finest piece of artistic work yet turned out by this company. Between 1883 and 1887, Tiffany and Company made almost monthly purchases from the Vance Manufacturing Company. And we know that in 1883, Tiffany and Company simultaneously purchased wares from Lysette and his China painting partner, John Bennett. Certainly, Lysette's esteemed reputation and technical knowledge must have motivated FM Co. to approach him the following year about directing the pottery and promoting its artistic agenda. Lysette had already had a distinguished career when he became art director of FM Co. in 1884. He was born in 1833 in Newcastle under Lyme, Staffordshire, and at age 12, he'd apprenticed as a china decorator at Copeland and Garrett, the former Spode manufactory in Stoke-upon-Trent. He received his artistic training there under the supervision of the art director, Thomas Batham, Jr. Batham Jr. introduced Lysette to his father, Thomas Batham Sr., and Lysette moved to London in 1852 to work for him. And here, for your visual enjoyment, I include an image that depicts Mr. Baxter's painting room at number one Goldsmith Street, Gow Square in London. Though it predates Lysette's time in London, it gives a nice feeling for life in a China painting studio that was actually located within a block of Batham Sr.'s studio and where Lysette would work. So, <clears throat> Batham's century-old establishment decorated China for manufacturers such as Worcester, Darby, and Colfort before the advent of in-house decorators in the late 18th century. China decorators and gilders and model makers were the elite artisans in porcelain manufacturing. Decorating China required artistic talent as well as technical skill to paint with colors that mutated in the kiln. And Lysette was adept in a variety of subjects, and he painted cameo medallions, seen on the left, highly finished classical figures, seen on the right, and these are both diminutive porcelain furniture mounts, as I, you'll see this in the exhibition. Um, he painted these, these objects um, also with naturalistic birds, fish, flowers, and landscapes with a complex polychromatic palette that is typical of mid-19th century English China decoration, and this training would influence his China painting style for the rest of his life. 
When 28-year-old Lysette arrived in New York City in 1861, he was one of hundreds of ambitious Englishmen who immigrated from the Staffordshire potteries to the United States in search of greater prospects and higher wages. Um, and here we see immigrants arriving at Castle Garden. Many of these potters learned to work with the native materials. They cut their teeth in Jersey City and Trenton, New Jersey, and the potteries in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, before moving on to other parts of the country to set up shop for themselves. Lysette and his children, uh, William and Emily, and his second wife, Rachel, who we see here, with whom he would have two American-born sons, Francis and Joseph, settled in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, then um, the Center for Ceramic Production in New York City. And it does seem likely that Lysette worked with established China painters immediately upon his arrival. But in January 1866, the retailer E.V. Howitt and Company hired him to paint additional pieces of the Lincoln dinner service for President Andrew Johnson. And here we see a detail of the center of a, of a, um, a plate hand-painted by Lysette with the great seal of the United States. And this major commission secured, a major commission of national note secured Lysette's reputation. Um, that same year, he established his own China decorating business on Green Street in Manhattan and eventually employed 40 decorators, both male and female. We know that during the next 18 years, Lysette worked alone and in partnership. This is typical in the late 19th century, the recombination of partnerships probably enabled um, China painters to complete larger work orders. And his firm painted China in a variety of styles over a broad economic range for retailers. For example, they decorated European porcelain blanks in the popular French revival styles or with elaborate monograms porcelain furniture mounts, as well as more utilitarian articles, such as bar pitchers, sink basins, um, sanitary wares, for which they were well known. In addition to managing a successful business, Lysette capitalized on the widespread interest in amateur China painting during the 1870s, and he fired China painted by many female practitioners, including Mariah Longworth Nichols, future founder of the Rookwood Potteries in his kilns, and he conducted China painting classes in his shop. His reputation as an excellent artist and instructor motivated the St. Louis School of Design in 1877 and the Cincinnati School of Design the following year to invite him to teach China painting classes. And here we see on the left two parts of a prospectus from um, the St. Louis School of Design. And let's see if I can do this here. Porcelain painting, you can see Lysette listed as the porcelain painting instructor right in the middle of the page. And then, um, and here we see his, his trade card from Cincinnati, confirming his presence in Cincinnati at the top. Lysette returned to New York in 1879 and formed a China painting partnership with John Bennett, with whom he would work until 1884 in Grange on Great Jones Street in Manhattan. And Lysette's trade card uh, printed with the street address is seen on the left. Um, the commemorative porcelain vase, a European blank, seen on the right, is dated 1883 and is masterfully painted with roses and signed under the vase by Lysette. And this vase illustrates the superior decoration that Lysette and Bennett probably were selling to Tiffany and Company at the same time that FM Co. was. And here we see one of my favorite objects, an exquisitely painted a porcelain watering can, also signed and dated by Lysette in 1883. And this, this um, object displays a more personal side of his work. The water lilies in bloom encircle the sides of the watering can. We have this beautiful forget-me-nots with gold centers on the, on the spout of the watering can, ferns on the top, and a wreath-enclosed monogram, LML, which stands for Lydia M. Lysette. This is his oldest, his eldest son, William's wife. And it seems likely that Lysette painted, this is in the property of Lysette's descendants, this watering can for his daughter-in-law on her fifth wedding anniversary. In January 1884, Lysette and Bennett dissolved their partnership, and Lysette made a dramatic career change. He ceased porcelain painting blanks to order and seized the reins to direct the aesthetic repertoire of the enterprising Fayance Manufacturing Company. In the year that they hired Lysette, FM Co. underwent a transformation, expanding physically and artistically. They clearly had big ambitions. 
Lysette and potter Jonathan Coxon certainly worked together after Lysette joined FMCO in 1884. You may recall Jonathan Coxon, the Parisian granite ivory body formula person we spoke about a few moments ago. So there appears to have been an overlap between the two of them. Lysette's formula books are extremely rare survivors that provide extraordinary insight into his continuous experiments with ceramic bodies and glazes to refine the firm's production. So in the front end papers of his earliest book, dated at the top, you say 1885, and seen here, Lysette lists recipes for ceramic bodies, including Coxon's recipe for porcelain, or Parisian granite, um, FMCO's principal ceramic body. Here we see the recipe on there, on the uh, center on the left, and Lysette's notes indicate that he purchased this recipe prior to Coxon's departure from the firm. For a brief period between 1884 and 85, in a move intended to confuse the consumer and not unknown in the ceramics industry, the firm changed its mark to a printed R, seen here on the right, within a crown circle. This is um, an, an imitation of the Royal Worcester and Crown Derby marks. This unusually shaped vase on the left is one of the few known examples stamped with this mark. And we know that by May 1885, FMCO showrooms moved again to their final location to Murray Street, which is seen here on the map. Murray, Barclay, Park Place, and Warren Streets form the center of the ceramics industry in, in the city, in New York City. A steam-powered steam elevated passenger train turned west onto Murray Street. You can see that there with the tracks, bringing customers right past the FMCO's uh, showroom door. The factory, however, was located in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, which was the industrial center for, for a variety of businesses, including the renowned Union Porcelain Works, and was one block from the waterfront. Um, goods could easily be brought by car to the ferry and then to Manhattan. And here we see a map locating the factory. I'm just going to come around here. So I can't really see it. Locating the factory within the surrounding street. So this is kind of, here's the, this the factory and then you get to see the grid of the streets and how close they were to the waterfront. But here is a detail of the factory um, <clears throat> on the right. So we'll come back to that in a minute. The factory was originally a three-story brick building in 98 West Street seen here. So here is the original three-story pottery right here. But the factory underwent an expansion in 1884, the time of Lysette's hire, and grew to encompass, here's 98 West Street, right there. And it grew to encompass this entire corner and then five storefronts down the side of Greenpoint Avenue. So <clears throat> um, here, 98 West Street housed the decorating department and storage, so this is right there, this is the first part, and this is the expanded pottery. You can see this is gigantic. And the rest of the structures um, house different facilities for pottery production. And if you look into the backyard, you'll see here, these are the ovens, so there are three kilns in the back lot. The dramatic scale of, of this expansion attests to the firm's ambition to succeed at art pottery production. Lysette's experiments enabled FM Co. to produce a wide um, range of ceramic bodies by 1886, and perhaps in recognition of these new refined bodies, they adopted the printed FM Co. monogram at this time. Um, as indicated earlier, the impressed numbers on the base still denote the shape, but the meaning of the painted numbers is less certain. They likely refer to decorators or to motifs. And it's Evident that Lysette's aesthetic designs emulated fashionable English and continental art pottery. If we look at this 1886 um, advertisement, the firm clearly states that they offer wares in Royal Worcester, Sev, Minton, and Royal Dresden decorations. And neighboring china and glass importers advertised and sold wares from European makers, such as Royal Worcester and Crown Derby. So if you look on the left in the L. Strauss and Sons ad, we see the names listed on the right-hand column, Royal Worcester and Crown Derby. And then also note here on the right the remarkable similarity of this vase to FM Co's production. This is illustrated in the Lazarus and Rosenfeld ad, and these are 60 to 62 Murray Street, virtually right next door. The exotic shape and handles, elaborate handles, of contemporary Crown Derby porcelain 
uh, objects such as this vase seen here have much in common with FM Coast wares. Nevertheless, several factors distinguished FM Coast wares produced under Lysette's tenure from those by rival domestic and foreign art potteries, and that those qualities are size, shape, and decoration. First, FM Coast wares are very large and typically measure between 11 and 18 inches high, although the firm did produce pieces from as small as six and a half inches high to um, 27, even 42 inches high, as you will recall. Even though second tier English firms, such as Old Hall Porcelain Works at Hanley, also produced large scale vessels, Royal Worcester, Crown Derby, and other prominent English potteries generally made these very overscaled uh, wares for, for world expositions um, solely. And so perhaps FM Co. was alluding to these exhibition pieces with their large ornamental ewers and vases. These objects were expensive to produce because fewer could be fired in a kiln at one time. And these vessels were displayed on a mantle or a table that were prominent objects in an aesthetic movement interior and were definitely the physical manifestation of the owner's artistic and cultural sophistication and wealth. Second, although the English influence is evident, Lysette aimed for more than slavish imitation. FM Co. shapes are unique. The firm employed an innovative shop practice by using interchangeable parts, and this is where things start to get fun as you begin to pick out parts that are reappearing in other objects. Ewers and vases have long segmented necks that either taper or flare. Near Eastern inspired bulbous bodies, here we see one, and eccentrically shaped pierced handles and covers that became hallmarks of the firm. Finally, their gilt embellished flamboyant motifs were painted in a vibrant palette, and as seen in this comparison of an FM Co. ewer on the left and a Crown Dark ewer on the right, FM Co.'s exuberant decoration contrasts significantly with the tight, crisp, very beautiful, but controlled designs on the Crown Darby viewer on the right. FM Co's wares are impressive in size and technically complex in decoration. They exhibit a self-conscious boldness that is distinctly American and illustrate the firm's ambitious response to European competition. Critics' reports on FM Co's products in contemporary journals in 1886 and 87 announced a great craze and a demand that was increasing rapidly for their Persian, Moorish, Chinese, Florentine, Greek, and Roman-inspired forms, and that the older the shapes are, the more they're sought after. According to these enthusiastic reviews, many of the firm's shapes reference ancient, medieval, and Renaissance objects in major museums, including the Louvre, the Musée Cluny, and the South Kensington Museum, now the Victoria and Albert Museum, as well as objects in private collections, such as those of the French ceramic historian Baron Davillier and the Rothschilds. Interest in historic forms was part of a larger trend in the ceramic industry, and Lysette would have been familiar with printed images of these famous objects from the growing number of ceramic history books published during the second half of the 19th century. So it's exciting to know, for example, here that a medieval Persian incense burner illustrated in Albert Jacquemart's History of the Ceramic Art, 1873, bears a striking resemblance to the FM Co. vase on the right. And here we see the celebrated um, Alhambra vase on the left with its very upright handles um, as a frequently illustrated object that most likely inspired the muscular upturned handles on the FM Co. vase here on the right. By using these venerated ceramic forms as models, Lysette intellectually elevated FM Coast wares and imbued them with historical old world associations. The firm's progressive production techniques, such as interchangeable parts, resulted in the creation of more than 50 large scale exotic shapes that recombine a variety of elements. So, for example, the pierced neckband on the vase on the left is repeated as the lip on the vase on the right. And two vases seen here say, share the same body shape but display different handles. Decorative motifs were also used interchangeably. A team of 25 highly skilled decorators, including the former Royal Worcester artisans James and Sidney Cowbell, painted the firm's vases and ewers with elaborate decorations that surpassed everything previously produced in this country, and that's a quote. 
Um, more than 30 decorative motifs produced during this period include exuberant Asian-inspired water lilies seen here on the left, peonies and prunus blossoms on the right, chrysanthemums on the left, the bird and bug and raspberry type motif here on the right, magnificent peacocks, dolphins seen here on a very large ewer seen in the side and um, in front view, in an amusing visual conceit, we see goldfish encircling the sides of a fishbowl form vase. And here we see wisteria on the left and wild roses with another bird um, amongst them in the right. Near Eastern arabesques, scrolls, ogies, as well as jeweled and luster decoration painted in vivid enamels enriched with raised gold paste. The same motif, chrysanthemums, for example, is found on different forms, or the same form might be decorated with different motifs, as seen here. And then we see this here again. In some cases, as seen on the peacock vase, naturalistic decoration covers the entire lower body. But more often, the decoration is divided into these horizontal bands. This is an, a, a tenet of the aesthetic movement um, that allowed for a more eclectic combination of motifs. Okay. During 1886, FMCO made a big push to promote these stylish new wares, and they, they continued to advertise in trade journals, such as the um, Jewelers Weekly, and here we see their new advertisement, but they also targeted the more consumer-oriented decorator and furnisher, and here we see their advertisement from this periodical. Both ads depict highly decorative vessels within strong aesthetic movement designs that incorporate artistic lettering and eclectic Asian textile inspired motifs. For example, that spiral filled background at the top or this illusionistic mesh scroll banner that you see forming the diagonal across the center of the advertisement. And here we see on the right a covered vase that corresponds to the first large vase illustrated in this, um, this advertisement, this rare advertisement. In November 1886, the decorator and furnisher praised the Fayence Manufacturing Company's wares for their, quote, remarkable evidences of the advancement of art pottery making in this country, and illustrated Edward Lysette's signed drawing of the firm's new designs, seen here. And here is Lysette's little signature. A monumental 25-inch tall ewer decorated with a bird guarding a nest of chicks in a raspberry bush corresponds to one depicted in Lysette's drawing and suggests the scale of the illustrated works. As further testament to the firm's achievements, the following year, the decorator and furnisher stated, and I quote, again, American art pottery would have attracted but little attention a few years ago, but of late, such are the improvements that have been made in this class of wares. It is an endorsement to the American. Particularly is this the case with the goods shown by the Fayence Manufacturing Company. Their exquisite specimens have been greatly admired and for beauty of design and finish, grace of outline, and harmonious and artistic coloring, the productions of this house rank with the best in any country. Positive press such as this only accelerated FMCO's success and they sold at all the major retail establishments across the country. And these establishments, to name a few, included Tiffany & Company of New York, Bailey Banks & Biddle, and J.E. Caldwell of Philadelphia. And this um, very special large covered base is painted on the underside with the mark for fine crockery retailers Nathan Dorman & Company of San Francisco. And it documents FM Co's appeal with affluent West Coast clientele. FMCO participated in an exhibition organized in the fall of 1888 by the trustees of the Pennsylvania Museum and School of Industrial Art. This month-long pottery and porcelain exhibition was attended by more than 32,000 people. Individual potters and manufacturers were invited to submit work for show or for competition to display the progress in American pottery production. And the winners were awarded cash and their works or the, and their works were then accessioned by the museum. So here we have a very exciting new discovery, a letter in the Philadelphia Museum of Art Archives from FM co-secretary and treasurer Joseph Baruch to museum curator Dalton Dorr on newly discovered company letterhead. 
that indicates that the firm engaged Bailey Banks and Biddle to transport six vessels, presumably on display at the store, for inclusion in the exhibition, and Evemco was praised for their very handsome exhibit. So, though FMO's wares were critically acclaimed, in January 1889, financial difficulties presumably forced the firm to cease pottery production the following year. FMCO's output was strictly artware, and they did not produce more conventional products, as did large firms, such as Union Porcelain Works. In spite of the great beauty of their wares, the expense of producing labor-intensive ornamental ceramics was too costly to sustain and forced them to reorganize as agent for French porcelain manufacturer J. Pouillat of Limoges. And here we see uh, the firm's new advertisement in Crockery and Glass Journal um, indicating their new role, which is, uh, this is a big change for the FMCO. In addition, taste changed, and by the 1890s, interest in the aesthetic movement waned as preference grew for the French Beaux-Arts style. Because the firm no longer required an art director, Lysette retired at the age of 57, and shortly thereafter, he and his wife moved to Atlanta, Georgia, to live with their eldest son, William, who had established a china painting business there. And here we see an advertisement for William's school on the left, and his photo on the right. A handsome photograph, I think. And here I thought you might like to see a rare, unpublished family photo of Lysette on the left, uh, William with his daughter on the right, and then here we have, I believe, um, Joseph in the foreground and Francis in the background, probably sitting on the porch of William's house. In retirement during the late 1890s, Lysette returned to the detailed, naturalistic, and classical decoration that was typical of his earlier work. He painted on imported porcelain blanks, including game plates and vases, seen here for his son's business, as well as for personal enjoyment. And here we see another extraordinarily rare survivor. This is a pattern book that contains Lysette's sketches and watercolors, to which he repeatedly referred when painting sets of game plates. So he's taken a, um, a bulletin, a Pennsylvania Museum bulletin, which he's repurposed, a good example of recycling, by cutting it in half. And then here we see the inside, the groups of his watercolor sketches for game birth. And if you look on the outside, if you go back, you can see here he's listed rough grouse, the, the names of the birds in, in graphite next to the word game. And though some of the pages are missing, you can kind of get a sense of how wonderful these little booklets are. For example, um, <clears throat> Here we see a sketch of a pinnated grouse on the left, and here we see a corresponding depiction of pinnated grouses on the right on a game plate that is inscribed in Lysette's handwriting in the back with the names of these birds, and the game service is in the possession of Lysette's descendants. So I think we can make a clear connection. And here's the rough grouse from the pattern book and a rough grouse plate from this game set. So it gives us some nice insight into how China painting uh, worked in small reference books of their own creation. Um, Lysette also conducted experiments with different types of surface decoration, including the luster glaze found on medieval uh, Middle Eastern tiles and an iridescent glaze that he called precious murine and lump glass decoration. So here we see the iridescent glaze um, applied to tiles that were actually made by art pottery, J.G. Lowe art pottery, but if you look in this you can see there's an iridescence on the surface. That's what he's excited about. Here we see some specimens of his murine glaze, and then this is called lump glass decoration. Um, his efforts to exhibit his specimens and to contact museums in the United States and England about his experiments reveal his conviction in his discoveries, as well as his desire to secure recognition for his work. And the preeminent um, ceramic historian, Edwin Atley Barber, played a major role in Lysette's later life. Barber acknowledged Lysette's talent and promoted him as a significant figure in the world of American ceramics in a monographic article of 1895 that was entitled The Pioneer of China Painting in America. Much to Lysette's pleasure, after the publication of this article, the Smithsonian Institution accepted the gifts of his luster glazed tiles, beginning what would become the first repository in a museum collection of his innovative work, to which he would continue to add. And here we see an early 20th century um, photographic record of this installation in our National Museum. And I think you can, 
right? Here are the tiles that we were just looking at. And you can see there are many, here are the little murine samples, and then there, there are many other examples of his work. Edward Lysette's unique combination of artistic talent and versatility, his skillful self-promotion, and his ability to capitalize on opportunities at hand sustained his accomplished career for more than 50 years. Although longevity eluded the Fayence Manufacturing Company, under Lysette's short-lived but influential tenure, the firm produced robust, large-scale artistic ceramic wares that exemplify the American expansiveness of the late 19th century. <coughs> They enthralled people with their historicism and their exoticism, and they continue to do so today. Thank you.